Hello, um, we are the archiving team from this summer's uh, internships at Pacific Atrocities Education and we're going to present our project a little bit. So this summer we worked with documents um, that we tried to organize and these documents came from um, the National Archives of the United States. They were previously classified documents and they came from a lot of different countries, so from Japan and the US, obviously, and China as well, and European countries too, and other countries from the Pacific region. Um, the documents in themselves are mostly primary sources, and they include testimonies and letters between different governments and different government officials, their medical reports, telegrams, PMRs, many different types of documents and we've also worked with secondary source documents such as newspaper articles um, from the United States such as the New York Times but also from England for example or just many different types of documents that we've tried to collect and these documents range from the late 1920s early 30s to the mid 50s about yeah so as Julia said we dealt with documents from several different countries so uh, consequentially, we're going to have several hundred documents to deal with. Uh, so in the initial stages of organizing them all, uh, we put them all in a spreadsheet. Um, and so the most interesting part of this internship, in my opinion, was uh, reading through these documents, uh, figuring out how to organize them uh, based off where they came from, who, uh, who made them, uh, who was it for, uh, you know, the purpose, why. Uh, these documents were made. So we basically had to read through all of these documents and um, organize them in a way to where it would be accessible for, um, you know, for us to, you know, organize how we can put it on the, on the spreadsheet, uh, which is really interesting because as you read these documents, you got to experience and read, you know, what the vocabulary is like uh, from the, you know, 40s and the 50s, uh, and you get to see the structure of different government documents. Uh, so after we figured all that out, uh, the next stage was putting them into Amazon Web Services, uh, which I'm going to talk about. Yeah, so Amazon Web Service or AWS is the cloud platform we use to upload the organized documents that Adam talked about. And this is a really good middle step between the organization process and an official archival database. And we AWS for this project because the administrator has the ability to privatize the documents, which helps the organization create an open dialogue between relevant scholars and Pacific Atrocities Education. Um, yeah, so, um, okay, sorry, thing came up. Um, so now we have the database in AWS and we just need to make it usable. So that will involve um, putting the links onto the, our website and then um, having a search engine on the website so scholars can type in what topic they're looking at and being able to pull up all the documents right there that, um, that they're looking for. That'll help them do their research. And um, like any collection or archive, it's a growing fluid thing. So it's going to continue um, with more documents being added on, especially Especially as more documents are declassified in the United States or even in China and Japan. Um, and then we're also going to make finding aids, which are just a link between the documents and the researcher. So instead of a researcher reading 60 pages of information, they can just read the finding aid and see if the relevant information is in there. And um, that'll help with the mission of Pacific Atrocities Education to <clears throat> provide increased awareness of cultural atrocities during World War II, and um, that was what we worked on this summer, and that was our mission. For my internship project, I dove into the Hofbrauch trial which was conducted in the Soviet Union in 1949. It was the only trial regarding Japan's World War II bacteriological research and warfare. This trial also examined many of Japan's uh, um, bacteriological war crimes, which had gone unremarked at the Tokyo trial. 
And my project was divided into four different sections. Um, and so I focused on what led up to the Hofbrush trial, why the Hofbrush trial was initiated in the first place, what happened at the trial, and then what happened after the trial. And in each section, it was imperative for me to pose important questions so I could craft and round out arguments and so the research made sense to me. And so first I looked at Japan's preparation for the war against the USSR. Um, Japan's fear of the Soviet Union and communism was one of the main initiators that helped popularize militarism in Japan and also gave reason to fund um, biological warfare research because the Japan believed that they would go to war against the USSR and that there was no hope of them winning without sabotage methods. And then I looked at the Tokyo trial and I was very interested in what the Soviets did at Tokyo, how the Americans treated them, and what initiated the Hofbrauch trial. Because as it turns out, the Soviets were not dumb, and they realized that the Americans were cutting a deal with many top Japanese scientists who had worked at Unit 100 and 731. And the Soviets wanted to fulfill their own political aims, but they also had enough information to bring justice against um, the perpetrators. And that's what they did with the Hofbrauch trial. The Hofbrauch trial, of course, had ideological aims. They wanted to portray the USSR as a bringer of peace and the USA as a harborer of imperialist war criminals and that the US in some sense was an imperialist as well. Um, but there was a lot of good that came out of the Hofbrauch trial, a lot of good findings. They focused very heavily on the experiments, the horrific experiments that had gone on at Unit 731. Um, they also focused on the crimes committed against peaceful populations in China. There was a whole section on that. And then also crimes that get it, um, committed against Soviet civilians or Russians who had ended up in the camps. Um, and then I was also very interested in the West's dismissal of the trial, because after the trial, the Soviets sent all this information out. They told the world, we have all the information to convict the emperor of Japan and all these scientists in war crimes, and the US is harboring them. And it was the first time anyone, most of the world, had heard about this because the US had already gone and covered it up. So I was very interested in figuring out why the West dismissed it. And of course, we have to look at the context of the Cold War for that. At the heart of my project, I wanted to uncover and understand the impact of the Hofbrauch trial, why it happened in the first place, what the Soviets managed to discover during the course of it, and the impact of the trial on the international community in present day. And the, turns out the, the Hofbrauch trial was very impactful, even though the West dismissed it at first. Um, in order to achieve my understanding of this, I used primarily prime source material in Russian, since that was the official language of the trial. And then I used some excellent secondary sources in both English and Russian. And I thought it was important to use both languages because I figured that scholars in both regions of the world may have very different views on what happened and why those events occurred. So I thought it turned out to be very helpful and give me a more well-rounded paper. For my internship project, I also looked at the Chinese prosecution team at the Tokyo trial, also referred to the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. Um, and again, my project was divided into four categories with subsections. First, I looked at those who were chosen to represent China at the Tokyo trial, a bit of their background why they were chosen, and then also the arrangement of the Tokyo trial and how that might have posed 
some issues for the Chinese delegation. I then looked at the national interests and goals of the Chinese prosecution team in contrast with the government and then the international community because what the prosecutor wanted and the judge wanted was not always the same as what the international community and then the Chinese government wanted. Um, then there's a section on the Chinese prosecution team and Americans investigation into war crimes in China and this section is um, dedicated to the Nanjing massacre, Japan's opium trade in China, and alleged plague bombings which were not confirmed at the Tokyo trial but were later confirmed during the Holocaust trial. And then there is also a section that looks at the achievements and failures of the Chinese prosecution at the Tokyo trial and how the trial has impacted the international community long term. And again, in each section, I asked vital questions such as, what did they learn from this? How did this impact what happened next? And how did this influence the overall outcome, both short term and long term? For my research, I use primarily secondary resources in English by scholars and academics. Um, and as I undertook this project, I kept in mind a few key questions that I aimed to reveal by the end of the paper, such as what did the Chinese prosecution team hope to achieve at the trial? Why, more importantly, what difficulties they faced at the trial and why? So maybe how the Cold War and Chinese Civil War influenced the outcome of the trial. Um, what did the team discover and if they were successful in proving it, such as Nanjing, um, exposing that massacre to the world, the Japan's use of the opium to cripple Chinese society and fund their militaristic expansion in Asia. And then what were the major shortcomings of the trial? For example, the royal family was not tried and in consequence, Japanese politics were never really as reformed as they could have been. And then I looked at the long term implications of the trial that still affect us today. For example, Japan, while they have acknowledged their war crimes, do not talk about it. It is not um, a subject in Japanese education. And so I was very interested to see how all of this fit together and has not only impacted history, but today as well. Hi. My name is Maria, I'm from Finland, and I was one of the interns for this summer for Pacific Atrocities Education. And my topic is about how the United States handled the treatment of the Japanese war criminals in after the World War II, and specifically how did they were responsible for giving an immunity deal for the information that the Japanese had gained in World War II and before it. So, in my part of the study, I am first covering the first tips that United States took once they entered Japan, for example, how were they treating the suspects, Japanese war criminal suspects, and how did they gather information of the wartime actions. And then I am evaluating the process of gathering information from the scientists of the Japanese uh, biological warfare program. For example, how did the United States uh, accomplish within the interrogations that they had with the suspects 
and how did those in interrogations uh, go on and what kind of results they got from them and basically also explaining the methodology that the Americans had uh, in the interrogations. For example, the interrogations were not really that specific in terms of pressuring the war criminals. They were more of gentle. Um, in the end of my study, I am examining the details of the immunity grants and who were the main participants that were promising the immunity for the Japanese. For example, General MacArthur was a, a main character in there, but there was also other personalities involved. And of course, it is important to note that the Japanese scientists themselves uh, encouraged the Americans to grant them some kind of immunity for the protection of the Soviet Union. So it is a lot of important information to evaluate. So one of my most important research questions in my study was to find out that at which point the United States did decide to purchase the biological warfare information from the Japanese. And I believe that this information would be really important to find out and valuable because the United States was kind of a given its uh, outruling of Japan once they occupied it and they were the main co country that was responsible to prosecute the war criminals as was done uh, together with for example UK in Germany, Nazi Germany and for you United States to purchase this information for themselves is of course really selfish concerning the war crimes that were committed to civilians for example on American soldiers as well so it would be important to find out whether all of this information was intentionally kept as a secret in terms of wanting to purchase the information for the United States because uh, what was hidden was uh, gruesome atrocities that Japan had committed to and I think that because the United States did took a sole dominance over Japan and especially Mark Arthur did not allow other countries to help in terms of searching the former properties of medical centers in Japan for example United Kingdom was not allowed to send any troops to assist with the information gathering I think that it can possibly insinuate that the United States knew a lot of the information of biological warfare and wanted to get the Japanese side of it and that is why they did not let anyone else come into the country to help and that does kind of insinuate that the United States was ready to secure the information for themselves already at the beginning of the occupation. And in my study I am also uh, categorizing that who were the main characters behind the immunity grants and how was it all justified. For example, uh, Americans at least elaborated a great fear of the Soviet Union so that was one of the main reasons why they wanted to collect the information and justified it the reason of the fear of the Soviets to get the information. 
And overall, uh, this research is fulfilled with information from the original primary sources, uh, from the wartime uh, departments, intelligence operations of the United States, how were they perceiving Japan already during the war, how were they, how were they collecting the intelligence data about Japanese activity, and also on the occupation time, how United States handled all of the interrogations and seeking out the suspects of the wartime uh, atrocities. And these primary sources are uh, backed up with the uh, great research articles and books that I found. And when I am comparing the information with together the primary sources and the research literature to find out the truth. And my main goal was to reveal more information about the three-year process United States outruled. It is uh, three years of United States collecting information from the Japanese atrocities and keeping, the secret, keeping that information as a secret and not cooperating fully with other nations during the process and how they were basically balancing uh, whether they were going to prosecute or free the war criminals. And mainly it was uh, clear that from the beginning the United States already agreed to offer immunity to the war criminals. For example, the first person to inter interrogate the Japanese criminals, Dr. Murray Sanders, promised um, a verbal immunity in 1945. So, it is a three years filled with secrets and uh, keeping the information from other channels in other nations and it is a lot of information but it is a very fruitful research. Thank you. Hi, I'm Isabel Shao. I'm an incoming third year at UC Berkeley studying history. I'm Sophie DeWees. I'm an incoming second year at UC Davis studying history and economics. I'm Matt Tropesian. I'm a third year at the University of Chicago studying history. This summer we focused on Unit 731 of the Imperial Japanese Army, which was the Research and Development Center. Um, this Unit 731 conducted human experimentation on PLWs to help develop biological warfare weapons during World War II. I will be talking about the qualities of Japanese fascism and the context that allowed Japanese fascism to emerge. So the first aspect was ultranationalism. This began with the Meiji Restoration um, shortly after Matthew Perry, who was an American naval officer, came to Japan and forcefully opened the borders and forced Japan to engage in economic trade and diplomacy with other Western nations. In addition, the Russo-Japanese War and, the, and World War I demonstrated Japan's military might as they were on the winning side of both wars, but the Treaty of Versailles showed that the West was arrogant and unfit to occupy Japan. So as a result, Japan decided that they need to instill a different kind of philosophy within their own country first. This came with total control. In 1925, they had the Peace Preservation Law, which suppressed all dangerous thought. In 1936, the February 26th incident was a coup d'etat that brought about a military dictatorship and undermined the role of the emperor. Soon after, all major parties were dissolved as a continuation of the National Mobilization Law, which nationalized major industries such as the news media and rationing. With Japan's philosophy that the West was no longer able to no longer fit to occupy Asia, Japan had the idea of the Greater East Asia Co-Prosperity Sphere. 
this was basically the idea that Japan should be the one occupying the rest of Asia and liberating them from Western influence. The Great Depression was a major catalyst for this. As you can see in the table, the rice and silk prices plummeted with the Great Depression. So because Japan was overpopulated at this time, they needed new resources and new land. So they looked towards Manchuria in order to get some of these resources. This resulted in the Mukden incident and led to a conflict within the League of Nations that ultimately, ultimately led to Japan withdrawing. As a result, they were no longer checked by international pressures and were free to commit war crime atrocities. At the very core of Japanese fascism was their ideology. Just as Nazi Germany was united under Adolf Hitler, Imperial Japan was united under Kokutai. Kokutai directly translates to essence of the nation, and it's essentially a cult of loyalty to the emperor that dates back to the feudal era. As you see in the quote below, it says, Every single bullet must be charged with imperial way, and at the end of every bayonet must have the national virtue burnt into it. The imperial way and national virtue refer to Kokutai, so every single action, every single uh, atrocity, war crime that they committed was justified by Kokutai. The main tenets of Unit 731's endeavors uh, were to infect prisoners of war with diseases, uh, to conduct trial treatments using untested vaccinations on uh, controlled outbreaks of plagues in rural Chinese communities, and also uh, field trials of germ warfare. Uh, to meet these ends, uh, animal and human experimentation were conducted without any regard for the life of humans or animals uh, until they were deemed lethal enough for public use. And ultimately, Unit 31, very, what, U, Unit 731 was very successful in producing uh, bioweapons. Among weapons of mass destruction, bioweapons are relatively cheap to produce. In the words of Sheldon Harris, author of Factories of Death, bioweapons are cheap, simple to produce, and deadly. In 1969, the cost of inciting one casualty per square kilometer was $2,000 with conventional weapons, $800 with nuclear weapons, and $1 with biological weapons. The highly destructive and inexpensive nature of bioweapons made them greatly appealing to Ishishiro, and he used cost effectiveness as an argument for the biological warfare program in Japan. Beyond issues associated with monetary disparities, bioweapons pose many problems both logistically and morally. Um, bioweapons date back to ancient Greece, ancient Greece, where they made their first recorded appearance um, in the years surrounding the Peloponnesian War in the 400s BCE, when Sparta poisoned well water in Athens and faced a consequential blow to its reputation. Another significant instance of biowarfare took place when Mongol troops hurled plague-infested cadavers into Kaffa, a city in the Crimean Peninsula. Um, it is rumored by historians that this biowarfare attack could have been the source of the Black Death in Europe. Um, by the 20th century, um, even though bioweapons were prohibited by the Geneva Convention in 1925, the logistical and moral problems remained, and Ishishiro acknowledged that the pursuit of biowarfare violated medical ethics and could cause anguish to the unit's employees as doctors in a speech at the opening of Unit 731. Um, going back to the time period Isabel was talking about earlier, um, with the opening of Japan in the late 19th century to international trade, it also opened Japan to greater exposure to infectious diseases. Um, disease prevention became um, a priority during wartime with the Russo-Japanese War in the early 20th century. Um, and although during World War II, um, these programs turned on the offense with the development of bioweapons. Unit 731 produced 20 million doses of vaccines per year. Um, although there were numerous um, 
rumors and intel reported by the Chinese about um, Japanese instances of biological warfare. Um, they were not confirmed until 1944, and formal investigations did not begin until 1945 with the arrival of Murray Sanders. However, Murray Sanders and the subsequent investigator, Arvor T. Thompson, were unable to gain a holistic understanding of um, the extent of the biowarfare program in Japan. And it wasn't until 1947 with the arrival of Dr. Norbert Fell, a War Department bio, biological warfare specialist from Camp Dietrich, as can be seen on the right, um, arrived and he uncovered the full extent of biowarfare applications in Japan, including knowledge of Unit 731 and human experimentation. Um, the later investigators in 1947, Joseph Victor and Edwin Hill, um, argued for taking Japanese data as they were worried that it could fall into Soviet hands. Immunity was granted almost from the beginning with the arrival of Murray Sanders and was based on keeping information out of Soviet hands, as aforementioned, in addition to gaining truthful and complete responses and to supplement American findings related to biowarfare. Also in the aftermath of Unit 731's work, there were great environmental effects. Uh, the methods of distribution for their findings and their inventions uh, heavily involved the environment and the animal populations of rural communities, uh, including poisoning water supplies, both man-made and natural, like wells and ponds, uh, with diseases like typhoid, uh, releasing plague rats into local rat populations to spread disease, and also airdropping fleas from planes uh, that were also riddled with disease. Uh, one person who has stood up in the aftermath of environmental effects is Wang Zhang. Uh, she is a Chinese national that lives in Japan that had family roots in the community of Changshan, um, which was struck by Unit 731's work. Uh, decades after World War II, she happened to read a newspaper article about the survivors and the families of victims in Changshan. And she spent decades after interviewing and investigating the region uh, and ultimately took a lawsuit to Japanese court, which still today stands as the only admission of biowarfare on behalf of a body of the Japanese government. And even after the lawsuit, she continues to seek medical care for survivors and also educates the public with study tours of Trongshan. While there's never been an outright apologies on behalf of the Japanese government pre-731, sweeping updates were made to the Geneva Protocols of the 1920s after World War II. Uh, and with the formation of the United Nations, there was a stronger body with which to enforce those updates. Um, the use of biological weapons in nearly all instances was banned by these updates but the demonization of it's not. And a lot of the language of the Geneva Conventions seem to be directed at the actions of the Imperial Japanese Army at this time. Um, however, just a short while later in the 50s in the Korean War, uh, the United States was found to use similar tactics to release anthrax into communities by a Soviet group of scientists. And this would stand to reason that uh, Victor and Hill's pleading from Fort Detrick that Ishii's information was of the utmost value would have led to the deployment of similar tactics by the United States. And even though this connection seems to be somewhat similar to what the United States government did in Operation Paperclip, which was the importation of German Nazi scientists to the United States to help with the space race and other, other engineering endeavors, there's still a great deal of uncertainty on exactly what the role of Ishii's information was in later wars. Hello everybody, my name is Sun Wu Park. I'm currently a senior at Emory University. I'm a history major and a minor in political science and I am uh, from San Jose, California. Hello everybody, I'm Quinn Cho. I'm a sophomore at USC University. 
I'm majoring in history and international relations. I am from Chicago, Illinois. Okay, so a big reason why um, I decided to do this project is because I'm really interested in the Pacific War. I want to focus a lot on uh, relations between the United States and Pacific states. That's part of my honors thesis program at Emory. So I did this partial because I wanted to know how the U.S. interacted in um, East Asia during the World War and also just the progress of the war itself. As for me, I've long had an interest in military history, especially anything regarding the Second World War. Um, the areas, the theaters of the Second World War that are of most interest to me are the Soviet German theater and the Asia Pacific theater. However, I did not up to this point have as much uh, knowledge about the Burma campaign as I did about other parts of the war. Um, so in part, I wanted to join Pacific Atrocities Burma um, kind of account in order to learn more about the Burma campaign, number one, but number two, to also kind of use what I did know to help the project along and gain experience doing pro research with primary sources and secondary sources as well. Um, I think something I found out new that I didn't know before was just how extensive uh, the Japanese collaborators were during World War II. For example, the uh, Indian National Army and the Burmese Independence Army. I didn't know just how big the scale of those uh, two organizations were, as well as the fact that even uh, there were two Indian National Armies, for example, or the fact that the Burmese turned on, for example, the Japanese uh, supporters later on during the war because they were the solution. So I did feel like I learned a lot by interning at Pacific Atrocities Education. What I learned was the, uh, the specifics at the tactical level. Many of the specifics um, at kind of at your kind of battalion, uh, regiment, brigade, divisional level with regards to the, <clears throat> both the British Army in India, the Japanese, um, the Japanese Army, the Imperial Japanese Army, as well as the uh, Chinese Expeditionary Force and the um, Y force, X force and Y force. Um, it, I kind of I learned the kind of uh, specifics with regards to the, uh, for instance, the Battle of Mietkina in uh, northern Burma, I, and uh, the uh, Y forces operations after summer of 1944. <clears throat> I learned more specifically the, about the progress of Operation Ugo. But more generally, I also learned about how the war in Asia was particularly integrated, <clears throat> how events in Burma had a great effect on events in China and events in the Pacific and events in other parts of Southeast and South Asia, which is, uh, I think, uh, been a theme in Asian history, particularly in the last 150 years with the coming of European and Japanese and American empires to the region after the Industrial Revolution and the First Opium War. Um, World War II is kind of the, the, the epitome of East Asian, Southeast Asian, South Asian integration and the, how one event in one particular area can have great effects on other events in this in the region and i guess um for us uh, why it's important so for me uh specifically i found it really important because we don't talk about these things that much like for example not that many americans will think of burma for example when we think of world war ii they'll think of stuff like the battle of the bulge or like pearl harbor or the atomic bombing so in a way this is a minor theater in some aspects at least in americans minds but for me specifically, I think it really was a prelude to a lot of the chaos that follow after, specifically the defeat of Imperial Japan. And I think it also makes you understand though, why, for example, a lot of the Indians and Burmese turned towards Japan, an imperialist country, to fight against other imperialist countries. Because the resentment that filled up from colonialism really led them to become willingly embrace the Japanese cause. So do you feel like it really helps us understand like the mentality of the people who are living in the region and what they were doing during the war? Personally, I think the Burma campaign is important for a variety of reasons. 
I think firstly, it does have a decent influence on the course of the Second World War. There's often talk of Burma being a sideshow or a, not as strategically important as the Chinese theater or some of the fighting in the Pacific or even or like Malaya or Indonesia, which are rich in raw materials. And that's there's some credibility to that, but you have to remember that Burma supplies China. So Burma is how the Western allies get material and supplies to China. That's number one. Number two, Burma does have a pretty serious reserve of certain raw materials, tungsten, oil, rubber, teak, um, which is helpful to the Japanese war effort. And three, it, it has a, as a territory, it protects the flank of Japanese conquests in Malaysia and Indonesia, and it threatens both India and Yunnan province in China. So in that sense, at the kind of tactical operational level, it is important. And at the strategic level, it is also somewhat important. This is from the military point of view, the course of the war point of view. But in terms of kind of the general themes of history and of particularly East Asian history, Burma, the Burma campaign is also important as it is a multinational campaign, which, like I said, has great influence on the as Sun Wu pointed out, the, um, the decolonization campaign after the war, the various decolonization campaigns after the war throughout Southeast Asia. It has some influence over the course of events in China, um, both during and after the war, as you can see in the book that we wrote. Um, and it also, again, like as I stated earlier, Point, kind of highlights the integrated nature of East and Southeast Asia and how important events in one area of the continent are in other areas of the continent, particularly within the past 150 years, 200 years. Um, for these reasons, I think it is important to study and understand the Burma campaign as well as in with the added on factor of a variety of nationalities and peoples taking part in the campaign, um, which again is a point that we make in the first part of the book. Um, but that, that this is why the Burma campaign is important and should not be ignored in the historiography of the Second World War particularly in the United States, where knowledge about it is pretty low. Yeah, but we hope you enjoyed the, uh, the report that we made. And yeah, thank you for listening in.